Welcome to Surfer of Life. Hey, Happy New Year, people! 2019 starts with a great interview with Kenny Belay, who is a multiple world champion in bike trials. He has won nine times world championships, six times World Cup title. Ah, oh, what an athlete and what a character! He's gonna reveal the secrets how he became one of the best in the world in his sport. I stick with the show because in the end he's gonna tell all the details about his amazing adventures, how he was able to ride the high line with his bike in 120 meters. What a story! And now if you're wondering where I'm at, I'm actually in sauna. Well, I'm wearing my clothes because it's not heated up yet, but this is probably the only place and my house where I can be just in total silence. This is how it goes in Finland. The silent spot is sauna. Ah, 2019. Let's enjoy it and enjoy the interview with Kenny Bilay. Always look ahead, never look back, no matter what. And this is also a lesson that you learn as an athlete, that which you can also implement in life, is like, always look ahead. Even my mind thinks I'm not nervous, your body will still always put in a little bit of uh, ner nerves and stress, even if you uh, don't really realize it. Because I had more rest, I started riding better. Because I took it less serious, I started riding better. And actually, I can say since 2012, I am I have developed in a much better person as well, beside the bike. And uh, I, I could see how everybody was like getting really fed up and exhausted. And I said to myself, Dude, today you have to do it. And I did it. <laughs> I am Tommy and this is Surfer of Life. My guest today is Bike Trials multiple world champion Kenny Bilay. You have nine world championship titles six World Cup titles and won European Championships for three times. You are a Guinness World Record holder and done a unique trial bike slackline project first in the world. Because of your ability to clear seemingly impossible obstacles and pull off amazing saves, you earned the nickname The Magician. Your passion is your profession and you are traveling all around the world for shows, projects and competitions. Kenny, welcome to Surfer of Life. Hello, Tommy. Nice to meet you. How are you? I'm very good. I thought that you're going to go after this for a car ride. So I was wondering, usually when you drive your car, are you listening to some kind of music? And what type of music you normally listen to? Uh, I like to listen a lot to the uh, hard rock stuff, especially when I'm riding. But there's not such a... I'm not like a freak. I listen to a lot of things, actually. Uh, blues, it could be jazz, some ambient, some chill, chill out, some hip hop. Um, as long as it's quality music, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a fan. Yeah. What about heavy metal music? I read somewhere that you're listening to heavy as well. Yeah, I like heavy metal, but uh, not the screaming uh, kind of music. Just uh, where they're still singing, and then put like the hardest uh, guitar riffs there if possible. Uh, there are. Uh, if they do that kind of stuff, then uh, then they got my attention, yeah. Okay. I was wondering, because I was interviewing this one guy from Romania, Flavio Zernescu, who is doing all sort of balancing disciplines, and he is listening to heavy music as well. So I was thinking, like, what is the connection between heavy metal and amazing balance? Is there a connection? Um no, I don't think so, because in theory you would think you, we need like uh, Zen music and uh, this kind of music, but um, Trials looks very chilled, but uh, the explosive power that we need to jump onto obstacles, 
is uh is uh just crazy and for that we need to we like to get pumped and uh just get our adrenaline going and so we have maximum aggression and uh focus and then we can uh do better better riding that's that's my opinion yeah i hear you for the beginning let's talk about the sport itself can you tell me about bike trial as a sport well bike trial as a sport is uh it's it's um well it's wide it's a wide um a wide under you can like look at it in many ways but it all started so what i still do is competition trials and this is like where you get over obstacles with a bicycle and of course and then every time you put your foot down you get like penalty points and um, every time you cross a gate you win bonus points and uh, the the guy who crosses the maximum amount of gates is the winner so it's both physically technically um very demanding and um it's like compared to crossfit um but on a bicycle um and then you also have the other aspect of trials which is maybe more popular for the mainstream audience is is like street trials it's like the guys like Danny McCaskill what they do and they combine like uh, a little bit of what we do in competition with a little bit of what the BMX riders do and then they do more like a parkour kind of version of uh biking which is very appealing on videos uh competition trials on the other hand it's only one go uh a judge is next to you you only have one shot to get on the obstacle doesn't matter how you do it as long as you just clear it with uh like uh, without putting your foot on the ground so basically that's it okay how do you practice that what kind of abilities do you need to be a good rider um it's um Like I say, it's like CrossFit training. So you have to be a very complete athlete. Um, so it all starts with uh, basic uh, cardio. So the the wider your base is for um, your condition, is uh, the better you will be able to grow in the in the future. So that's very important. It means like I got I go running, I do enduro riding, I do cross country road cycling, I do all this kind of stuff. And then uh, this is something you do like in winter uh, to create like a, a nice uh, layer for the summer months. And then you start also with your um, your power, which is like in the gym. You do like a lot of core stability training. Uh, right now, last week, I did like a screening to see where my body is weak. So now we can work on those points. Um, and then it's about gaining maximum power which i will also do in winter so a lot of reps uh, a lot of repetition um to become really strong um and never to forget like the core stability because the small muscles around your spine and all that they have to be very strong to prevent injuries and then uh once uh let's say once the sun starts to shine again then we um focus on Uh, explosive power and then we do shorter reps very fast movements and then we convert that uh, body which uh, should be fit by then on the bike and then usually by when the world cup season starts then uh, we are ready to uh, jump on our maximum and hopefully higher than the year before so you really need a strong body to be able to do your sport what about the mental aspect how do you practice that because for me it seems like the places look pretty dangerous and there's a lot of stuff going on and competitions and people watching the sport how do you practice the mental part well there's a lot of uh, things that uh, make you strong mentally and it's just you do a lot of competitions i've been doing it since i'm nine years old and uh, the struggles you 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 meet during that period is just crazy it's like you have so many there's more bad days than good days actually so there's days that you're you're like making so many mistakes uh when you're young in competition and training and then you don't know how or what the problem is and then this makes you strong this is so i would say trial and error makes you mentally very strong um it's maybe also like uh, your personality if you're if you like 
in my case, what made me strong mentally, for example, is I never had a manager. So I was dealing with doing 100 shows in a year in like 17 countries and four continents, uh, organizing everything by myself and then still going to World Cups to compete, to ride, uh, to be fit. I mean, all this org organizational skills that you have to like put in place in order to do that, um, they make you, I think, strong mentally. And then you take a little bit off before the competition, and then like it, your your mind just goes, uh, yeah, it goes, it becomes like a, like superhuman, I would say, where you can like handle all these things. Like you just have to focus on one competition, which is a piece of cake because you're used to do to deal with so many other things. And this was always my strength in competition. Like just you just take a little bit off, and then the compensation mentally and physically. Uh, just makes you perform beyond your limits. Yeah, so repetitions after repetitions. Let's try a little bit back in time. You told me that you were nine years old when you started competing. How did you become a trial biker? Well, um, I still remember we were uh, at a holiday, my dad and my my mom. Um, I think my brother wasn't even born. Um and we had like a chalet that we rented um, in the forest in the south of our country, where is uh, where trials is more popular than here. And uh, one of the bike rentals uh, had the, a trial bike. And my dad was a trial biker before I was born on a motorbike. So he rented the bike for me and I did some little laps in the forest. And then I still remember he... Um, he bought a motorbike again um, and then and my, my brother was born too. And then he, uh, he also joined on these competitions of uh, our, our dad. And then my dad saw that we really liked riding the bike bicycle. Um, so he sold all his gear again and our parents, they just started driving us all over the world uh, from Czech Republic to Slovakia, to, to Spain, back to Belgium, then, yeah, we were like intense months of traveling and every summer we were gone. Every weekend uh, we were in the south uh, of Belgium, just two hours from here, training every single day. How important is that support from your family when you really want to be good at something? It is crucial. Um, it is the most important thing, in my opinion, because just to have a statistically, uh, just a, a fact, uh, right? Um, if I, I can put a face on the parents of all my closest competitors, the guys that never made the top or who are like sub top, I have never seen their parents. And that's just one factor of why they probably never become like the best of the best riders is because that factor of their parents being behind them from when they get a bike to going to the competitions, to going with them on training. And I think it's the most important thing ever. If you want to be good, you need the support of your parents or that's, someone who's close to you. That's a very good factor. Yeah. When, when did you realize that you can actually be the best in the world? What was the point? Um, the best in the world? I mean, it was also, it was always, um, I was always really good when I was uh, a junior and a, and a cadet and even before that, the Benjamins, I was already, I think I was on the podium as soon as I started competing. Um, and then you start dreaming, like, could I be, like, when you're 14, 15, 16 years old, you're, like, dreaming, like, could I be one, like, could I beat those elite guys, like, the guys who are, like, three, four, five years older than me? And um, I still remember uh, that one competition when I was 17, um, and I beat... Uh, the master of trials, the elite. He's my. He was my idol forever, and I beat him that day. And that's the point um, where I say, okay, now I have to go all in even more and work even harder because this is this is the point where I realized, okay, I can be the best of the world. And ever since, I I like I never stopped having that thought. I believe it was 1998 when you were won the first world championships and since then you won many times 
how did you actually been able to keep the hunger to win more and more? Because occasionally in athletes, you see that they win a couple of times and then they just, they stop. They don't have the motivation anymore. How is it with you? Um, I think it's obsession where you, I'm just a hard worker from nature and I, I work so hard that whatever, I, and I think that's also the reason that I always was uh, on top of my game. Uh, um, and so, and the, I don't think I really, there were years when I was younger that I was really hungry to win. And I, there was only one thing that I wanted and that's to win. Now I got older, I, I must admit it's a little bit less. So the hunger to win is always been so high combined with the fact that I just like to work hard and always, um, it, I mean, fr from the outside, if you look at trials, if we train, It uh, somebody who has never seen it, he probably if he's watched me for a week, he will probably think I'm doing the same thing. But you always try to perfect things. And if today I can jump onto an obstacle which is like one one forty one hundred forty centimeters, for example, I'm I'm like okay, good. But tomorrow I want to do one forty one. And if that works, that's my standard, and I don't want to lose that standard. And so far, I have been able to. Maybe I don't jump the highest of all of uh, all uh, riders because that's impossible. I'm like the oldest rider now, but I can say that I kept my standard for uh, 25 years, and I jump higher now at age 35 than I jumped at age 25, just because of that mentality of okay, this is my standard. Tomorrow I got to do better, and I do better. And I mean, there's always something that you can perfect, and This kept me on top of my game for for many years, yeah. You just recently came back from China, where was the World Championships held. Yeah. There it didn't go that well. What happened? You became no, sixth, uh, right? Yes, yes. I mean, I was in the finals, which was uh, good. Uh, I would have been third if I didn't have a puncture for in the semifinals. Uh, th that was all great, but in the middle of the semifinals, my uh, an old injury, my tennis elbow started to come back. I haven't felt this in many years. That's why also I didn't ride with any kinesio tape or anything like that because I was confident it was gone. But uh, a semifinal in trials is very long, so you constantly have to warm up, cool down, warm up, cool down. And uh, first of all, I I don't like it. I never liked it. I never liked it when I was a kid, and I definitely still don't like it now that I'm 35. And uh, yeah, it, my body just didn't handle that well. Um, so the tennis elbow came back, and the next day in the finals, even already in the warm up, um, I felt like, like, damn, I have no power. I couldn't jump or pull or like. I took some painkillers, but still, it was like it wasn't the pain. There was just no power, yeah. and uh, yeah. Then you start to ride, and after the third obstacle, where I had to like react very explosively, I already felt. I already knew, like, man, there's no power here. There's like no way that I can like uh, go all in. And then, of course, your uh, your hunger and your killer instinct doesn't just doesn't wake up. And I was just waiting for the competition to be finished, to be to to be honest. And um, I did some nice things, but they were just isolated moves, nothing uh, consistent. And uh, yeah, no chance. Podium is always possible, even still today. To win or to become second with those two guys, the French guy and the British guy, I have to be realistic. It's really hard. I have to count on the on them to have a really bad day. Um, but uh, podium would have been possible but not uh, not this year no which is a pity because uh, I was nine times on the elite podium in a row so it would have been the 10th time and uh, yep just didn't happen <laughs> how did you react after that competition ah listen um, if I would be if I would be uh, 22 I would be depressed for two months And I would maybe get really fat now because I, I would eat a lot of things that I shouldn't eat, <laughs> like a decompression kind of mentality. Now, uh, I, it's maybe weird to say, but I don't, I don't really care. 
it's like I put it in perspective. I'm like, there's first of all, there's a lot worse things than becoming sixth in a world championship. Secondly, I've won so many times. It doesn't really matter that if I win or not. If I win, of course, it would be awesome. But if I'm not, my sponsors still like what I do. Um, they are there to support me no matter what. Um, and uh, life goes on. And I just, after two days, I just started working on the next project. Yeah. And I started working on shows and bookings and, and planning 2019 already with uh, my sponsors. And like, I mean, it's all right. It's, it's life. It was good. I tried. I did my best. It didn't work out. And there's nothing more I can do. I saw a picture of you on your Instagram account. And your comment was, the eyes reveal everything. Was that yeah. the killer instinct missing there then? Oh yeah, hundred percent. This is, like I say, I'm um, I'm convinced that uh, the top riders were all we're all very good riders. Um, maybe one can do like a little bit two percent more than the other, and but the reason I was on the podium a lot of the times is because of my killer instinct. Because. I don't make stupid mistakes because I go all in. I just fight until the last section. Uh, this this mentality, and I had that last year, while I was third, and I didn't have it this year. Of course, with the injury, that's why I was sixth. So it's simple. Yeah. And my wife said it like he doesn't have this uh, look in his eyes, which I usually do. And I, it's true. I, I like I like I say, I was just waiting for it to be over. <laughs> <laughs> You are a really pumped athlete to ride for the victories that I understand right now. But how important is sportsmanship? Um, how important is sportsmanship? You mean towards... The other life? athletes and towards everything about the sport. Because I come from a competitive background. I used to play ice hockey for as a professional. And I don't think it was a healthy environment occasionally. There was not if i understand sportsmanship correct it was lacking for sure because you were competing against the, each other occasionally in the team as well to trying to get your spot and i don't know occasionally it was a good team uh group attitude or whatever and but sometimes it was just terrible i don't know what about your sport and you yeah. yourself yeah I, be, i must be honest uh sometimes i don't like the mentality in competitions either I'm a chill guy. I'm a friend of everybody. And uh, too many times I had um, situations where the competitive uh, side of a person becomes a really ugly side. And then I don't like that. I mean, uh, I wish it could be different. And I was the same when I was much younger, I have to admit. That were actually the years that I won everything. And I was also very competitive also towards other riders. And then I was like, hold on a minute, this isn't this isn't right. You know? It's not that I have to be best friends with the competitors, but mm -hmm. at least sportsmanship has to be in place in order to uh, to give a good image to the sport and to go home and, and, and finish your career with a good feeling. And um Like I say, when I was younger, I experienced it myself and I fought against it. And I can see it happening to a lot of really young riders that uh, they become superstars and then it goes to their head and they become very arrogant. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm really against that. And I will always, um, yeah, I think it's very important to just stay yourself, stay true to yourself, to your, and be, be, I know, I know. We need aggression to um, to perform. You need that, but you should keep it for yourself and not um, show that to the world or reflect that onto others and and create uh, discussions or aggression or I mean and to start uh, start to nag about really stupid things from the rules and I'm like, come on guys, everybody's here to have a good a good time. And uh, I'm guilty. I was like that like many years ago. But now that I'm older, you put it more in perspective. And um, yeah, I think sportsmanship is really important. 
Um, one thing that I like about competing at the highest level is um, you take all that experience from sportsmanship and values, which you have to use in sports, you take that with you in life, in the way how you approach and like things in business with sponsors, with um, when you go negotiate, when you, um, the way you act, you treat your friends with respect, because that's what sports is all about too. It's respect and you also realize you can do anything uh, just by yourself. You need a fantastic team and people around you. And these are all things that um, yeah, just make you a better, a better human being. That's what I believe. Yeah. Talking about values, what are your values? My values are, um, yeah, I don't know if hard working is a value. I think so. <laughs> um, yeah, hard work, uh, respect, uh, gratitude. If somebody did something for you, I will, or for me at least, I will be grat like I will be grateful for forever. I'm still, I still thank the people personally who made my career to what it is today. Like, um, even if it's a small introduction to a sponsor or if they gave me some advice, I always like thank them and I will keep doing that. Or when there's like a party, I will invite them and I will really tell them like, without you, it wouldn't have been possible. So that's something I value a lot. Um, and, um, try to be empathetic and or empathetic, empathetic, sorry, that's the English word. Um, Because, um, yeah, it's also important, I think. And um, the older I get, the more I value that. And, um, yeah, respect, hard work. And I think with those values, you will get very far in life. Yeah. Let's talk about competitions a bit. How do you prepare yourself for a competition? Um Like how how long before a competition you mean? For example, and what do you do before? Uh, so yeah, I, uh, if I compete, um, I'm it's on my mind that one date that I really want to be good. It's on my is on my mind for 364 days a year. That's that's to start with. Okay. Uh, and then you work. Uh, you you have to create like a, a a master plan in your mind. No matter like. I do a lot of things that aren't good for my my physical shape and my to be ready for a competition because I travel so much. I have so many jet lags, but you have to kind of have like a master plan where you know, okay, I want to be good at that month. So and then you like build in your training within my crazy lifestyle. That's where I plan my trainings in, and I might be going to the states and being jet lagged as as hell i will still put in my training but maybe not as intensive that i planned two days ago because i'm much more tired than i want to be but then i will still go to gym and do the maximum possible at that moment and that's important always do the maximum possible according to the situation and always respect uh, resting periods and then um Like I explained at the beginning of the of the interview, first it's about cardio and basic power. Then you convert that to explosive power, and that's how you become fit for that one competition, which is for me the most important. Is always the world championship by the end of the year. Okay. So you gotta have you gotta put like it's like a big puzzle in the beginning of the year, and then you put the pieces together, and yeah, that's how it goes. Are you or have you ever been nervous or scared before the competition? Oh, yeah. I'm always nervous. Even if I say I'm not, or if people ask me, are you nervous? I will go like, no, nah, I'm not nervous. But deep inside, I am. <laughs> <laughs> And it's crazy, like, how your body, like, sometimes, um, like this time, for example, I actually knew that somewhere I knew that I didn't 100% do what I should do to be to go to the world championship because I had a jet lag the two weeks before. So I kind of blocked that my, that aspect from my mind. And I said, look, I kind of ignored it. 
but it was there and it made me nervous in a way because uh to give you one example my my lymphs here they were like swollen all week when i was in china and i thought oh, i have a little infection or not. and finally uh, funny enough the day after the competition it was gone and i didn't feel anymore so it's like even my mind thinks i'm not nervous your body will still always put in a little bit of uh ner nerves and stress even if you uh don't really realize it how do you overcome that um like i say i try to ignore it mm -hmm. and i listen to music um i read a book i before competition, I take like a, a hot bath, just relax, uh, got massages, and I don't train a lot the week of the competition. And this makes me nervous too, because I have too much time on my hands. And uh, then I, sometimes I can't wait just to go work out, even if it's uh, a little like a little gym session or whatever I can do. This is uh, This is key, just to work out a little bit, just to get the stress out of your, the stress out of your system yeah. your sport demands a lot of focus how do you stay focused while you're riding when you have your run or if you lose if you drop your leg touches the ground or the obstacle how do you get back in the game how do you get back that focus you had yeah so first of all when you make a mistake no matter how big or small it was don't think back about that mistake because too many times uh, I see it when riders make, uh, they crash or whatever. Um, they they leave their head hanging and they like, they start to be, they start to be depressed and they're like, oh, I'm going to lose. And this. no, it's over when it's over because the others also still have to go on. So you always have to look, always look ahead, never look back, no matter what. And this is also a lesson that you learn as an athlete. That which you can also implement in life is like always look ahead don't look back there's nothing you can change what, what are you going to do you're going to buy a time machine and change what you just did it's impossible why are you looking back look ahead and go to the next obstacle and this there is a fresh your fresh start and it's not about the competitor it's not about uh winning or losing it's about the obstacle and you go over you go through the section, obstacle by obstacle, uh, centimeter by centimeter. That's how you go through it. And it's over when it's over. And then you can see the result. But uh, And if you start with that mentality, with that focus, then normally you end up well. That's a great advice for everybody who's <laughs> doing any kind of sport. So anything in life, I like that. What yeah. about 2012? You had a wrist injury. How did that change you as a rider? Um, it changed a lot because I, uh, to give you an example, I was winning every year something like a World Cup or a World Championship or uh, or all all of them in a row until 2011. And then in 2012, when I broke my wrist, it totally changed me, like totally. Mentally, um, especially mentally, because there I realized... Um, uh, as I say, I do a lot of projects like shows and video shoots and working with sponsors. And that actually is what I live from. This is making me money. Mm -hmm. Competitions, on the other hand, they cost me money. So when I broke my wrist in 2012, I said, okay, hold on a minute. I just broke my wrist in a competition. And why? I have financial responsibilities. And from there on, I took it less serious. And the funny thing is, because I took it less serious, my riding went better. <laughs> I started riding better, jumping higher, losing more weight, easier. Um, started, and I was like, hey, this is fun. I'm taking it less serious. I'm doing a lot less competitions because that was a decision from that year. I, instead of doing like 15 or 20 competitions a year, I only did like five to 10 max. And, um, because I had more rest, I started riding better. Because I took it less serious, I started riding better. And actually, I can say since 2012, I am I have developed in a much better person as well, beside the bike. Because I've been seeing new things. Because until like from 1998 or even when I started, 97, until 2012, 
the only thing I could think about was competing. And when they started, when they booked me for a show, like I was on a show tour, let's say for Red Bull in uh, in Egypt, I was doing, I was doing the shows, and I was, I was happy to do them. But in the back of my head, I, I was just thinking about, damn, I'm missing all these trainings. I should train and rest. And 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 my competitors, they're like, and I was always in a constant stress. I was in a constant emotion of of uh, mental state of of stress, and I hated it. And uh, in 2012, I just, yeah, much more relaxed and even until today, six years later, much more fun to to actually do trials. And the funny thing is in 2012, after the injury, I said to all my sponsors, yeah, I might retire and this and that. And, and yeah, they still ask me every year, you're still competing? Didn't you retire like five years ago? I'm like yeah, I'm like enjoying it more. It's it's going better than before. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy that you really actually need to get an injury or something needs to happen to realize some sort of things. As long as it's not too bad. <laughs> exactly. And I met a um, a very famous coach from uh, one of our Olympic uh, judo athletes at the airport. Right after I was injured, and he told me, Kenny. He said, Kenny, you'll come back stronger as ever before. He says, never underestimate the uh, power of an injured athlete. He says, every every injured athlete who comes back, he comes back stronger. And he was right. Yeah. He was absolutely right. He was absolutely right. It's um, because uh, if you always do the same thing for many, many years, it kind of makes you not stupid, but... You go very, it's very monotone. You're always doing mm. the same thing. If you step out of it because you're forced to, I couldn't ride my bike for several months. And if you step away from it, you're like, it's like a whole new world opens. And you're like, oh, wait, hold on, wait a minute. What was I thinking? I've been very much doing the same thing over and over again, no matter that I didn't progress anymore. And then, yeah, then magic happens. But try to explain this to thousand athletes that they have to take off a couple of months and do something completely different. 999 will say no and they will be afraid to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You need an injury because it has happened a lot in different sports that somebody gets injured and maybe just before Olympics or something and you're one month off and you yeah. don't even have that much time for the preparation before the competition, then you go and you win gold medal. Because yeah. you got that break, you need it, but you're not able to actually take it when you are in a good shape. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. Let's talk about the shows you are doing. Tell me about the shows. Yeah, the shows, I mean, I started doing shows really uh, shortly after, because... Every trials rider is doing shows, I think, almost, because it's just, it's a good way to make money, to entertain the crowd, to show your sport to to people, and people are just always blown away when they see a guy jumping onto a table, let's say, with a bike, and they're like, whoa, how the hell they do that? So it's always a, a crowd pleaser, and it will stay for that for many years. And I started doing shows when I was, uh, I actually have a picture there. Uh, I started doing shows when I was about uh, 12 or 13 years old. Uh, so it were like fairs and like village parties and uh, I don't know. I don't know where I've been everywhere doing shows like openings of uh, buildings. Um, and I started just asking the organizer, hey, can you give me an old car and uh, 50 pallets and some nails and then and some uh, bricks that I have to put under the car because if not it's it's wobbling too much. Um, yeah, it was it was a good time and um, I was touring all over Belgium. I don't think there's one village in Belgium that I haven't been doing shows in the last years. And from there on, you yeah you get the attention of sponsors and media and and it was like uh, it was also a challenge because when i had the attention of the media it was because of my shows and it took me like 10 years to convince them that because i was world champion doing a show so they saw me doing my show and they think oh he's world champion in this 
And I'm like, I was, it took me 10 years to explain it. No, no, no. This is a show, a competition. Just, just come and watch. It's like high intense. It's, it's crazy. It's like physically, it's mentally. So I managed to do that. Uh, so they were a great tool for me to get to the mainstream and get attention for my sport, especially in a small country like Belgium. Mm. Uh, if you do it for 20 years, in no matter of time, you start to learn to meet everybody from business and companies and media. And this has opened a lot of doors for me. Um, and now, uh, fast forward uh, 25 years later, I'm doing shows for uh, NBA halftime shows for the Bulls, the Pacers, the Bucks, the Clippers, uh, the Warriors. And this is just, I mean, there's no way, like I would have never imagined that when I was nine. And in Europe, we have a uh, big trailer, actually two big trailers, and we tour all over Europe with it, with a uh, live DJ. Uh, it's named Pedal to the Metal, Pedal with a D, from, uh, sorry, Metal, I mean metal with a D, not a T, like from wearing the medals. Um, and we tour all over Europe. It's with live DJ, MC, BMX freestyle, freestyle mountain bike, uh, flatland BMX. And we put on 40 minute shows three times a day, get, do some giveaways, meet and greets, uh, kids get to try out a trial bike. And uh, yeah, this is just an awesome way to um, convert a niche sport where theoretically you don't make money off into mm -hmm. something that can actually monetize your sport. How does it feel to jump over six cheerleaders on an NBA halftime show? I just watched a video before this conversation. It looked just awesome. <laughs> yeah, to jump over cheerleaders <laughs> always scares me because I'm like... Like, yeah, it's it's tricky. Uh, I mean, you're always like, oh, man, I hope nothing goes wrong because there's so many people watching. ESPN is filming me here. Uh, don't make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's always uh, every time I'm in the air over them, you can hear them like screaming like. <laughs> I think it, I think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and thousands of people are watching and cheering. It yeah, looked, that's it great. I mean, it's. it's yeah, it's awesome. I mean, yeah, like now I've been doing it for five years. The yeah, five, six years. The NBA NBA shows, and every year I think, oh man, it will be it will be the last time because they've seen me. But if you think about it, the country, the US, is so big. Mm -hmm. If I do one show, one team per every year is like that's like fifty teams. I mean, or thirty something. I mean. Yeah, it's uh, it's great. It's fun. Yeah, many many years to go. Still. Many years to go. Yeah. yeah, you are involved with a lot of projects as well. Yeah, you have you're Too doing your public speaking, drones and films, Casa Bilay, vlogs, and you are organizing the UCI World Cup in Belgium, and these NBA shows, and big time trial adventure as well. But one precise project I want to ask about it's the slackline project can you tell me more about that yeah so I still remember in 2010 uh, Adidas invited me to do shows in South Africa and they also invited uh, Lucas Imler a uh, professional slackline uh, athlete to perform and uh, I still see his slackline and doing him backflips on it and, and I, I tried to walk on it and it was just impossible and uh, there we said, like, uh, just like very briefly, hey, what if I rode my bike on it? But I didn't even try it. It was like, just, it would be impossible. And then uh, two years later, I was in France uh, riding on a ski lift. And there they said, the producers, hey, man, can you put a slack line between the two uh, ski lifts? And I was like, no, it's impossible. And then the idea, it, like, it never left my head. And in two thousand end of two thousand fourteen, I I never I, I never tried a slackline to ride it on my bike before ever. Wow. And I just I just went to my sponsor and I said, Hey, what if I put a slackline somewhere and I rode it on my on my bike? And the Adidas, Red Bull, everybody who I talked to, 
you know, usually it's hard to get budget for anything because, you know, and everybody, they didn't even ask how much it was going to cost. They were just like, yeah, that's awesome. Let's do it. And I was like, shit. <laughs> They're really, okay. I was like, well, hold on a minute. Let me just, let me just try first to ride it, okay? I uh, just put uh, two cars uh, the, facing each other with the, the tow bars and I put yeah. the slack line in between, put some old pallets under there and just started riding it. And uh, that was at my parents' place. Wow. And I still, I still remember my dad coming outside and I was falling off even after half a meter. My front wheel fell off, my back wheel fell off, both wheels fell off. Then I, I, I fell and I started rolling against the, <laughs> up, like, uh, the stuff that was there in the garden. And my dad comes out and he's laughing. He's like, man, you, you will never be able to do that anywhere. He's like, and I was like, fuck. He's maybe, <laughs> and it was like a challenge. I was like, challenge accepted, man. And uh, I started training my ass off. I put the slack line here in my backyard um, and uh, just started training that every day. I, and I was doing it on a mountain bike, an enduro bike, not on a trials bike. So I basically... I literally stopped doing trials for like five or six months. Okay. I didn't like trials anymore. It was just, just doing this slackline project every day. And uh, I was wearing a full face helmet and uh, body protection. And it was just one meter from the ground. And I was falling off so many times. I even one time fell in my swimming pool <laughs> because uh, it was just next to the pool. And I fell in. And it was so frustrating. I tried thousands of times, tried thousands of times until I finally was mastering it. I could say I was I was at a point on the low line at the one meter from the ground. I was pretty good at it. And when I did, when I felt that I was ready, um, we went to the mountains with uh, Lucas, the guy that I met in 2010. And I said, we were looking for the perfect spot to do this project. And I was sponsored by Les, uh, Paradis Ski, which is a French ski resort. And uh, yeah, we were looking for it for two days in a row, finding the perfect spot. And we almost gave up because because we couldn't find anything that was decent. The, 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 the rocks were always like overhanging or it would be dangerous when I fell. It wasn't high enough or it wasn't spectacular enough. It was always something. Because for a slack line, to, when you put a high line up, has to stay safe mm -hmm. um, so you have to have clearance at both end and starting point when you fall off with the rocks and stuff um, and then the last day of our scouting we discovered uh, a place in La Plagne uh, between two mountain tops and it was 120 meters from the ground but you have to know I have I have vertigo like no one no one has more vertigo than I do I'm telling you and Lucas, he was just standing on the edge with his feet like five centimeter from the 120 meter drop because he's, he's a highliner. He, for him, it doesn't matter. And he's like looking with his binoculars to the other side like, oh man, Kenny, this is perfect. This is the distance you can do because he knew at that point I could do 18 meters. He says, it's exactly 18 meters. And then he climbed to the other side of the rock with the old rope it was like this thick. Yeah. he just he just grabbed it no security like just like a tyrolean he went to the other side and he's like yeah the rock is perfect and he was like hammering it and like i'm like lucas with the best will of the world i said we have to find the spot which is which looks crazy but which is not crazy and this is crazy and it looks even crazier and he's like, no, if you want to do it, be the first guy on a bike. And you don't want people to copy you in the next years. I went, I went on my, I was sliding to the point where he said I had to start. And it was, there wasn't even a place to start. It was like a tiny, like a half a meter rock, which I can stand on with my one foot on, on the pedal and left to, of me like a 120 meter drop. How scary and was that? The, it was it was the scariest thing. And I just stood up. I took all my courage that I have. And I stood up. And I was holding like one. I was uh, attached to a mountain guide. 
with a rope and I was holding it like uh, like my life was depending on it. And I stood up and I said, you know what? I'm just going to do it. And I turned around and I went back to the car and I started making phone calls to uh, a friend of mine who has like scaffolding, you know, where they build uh, scaffolding for buildings. And I said, I need two towers, 15 meters high. And we're going to attach them to the trees. And my friend in his uh, backyard, he has like 25 meter high trees. We're going to attach them to that. And I'm going to put a slack line between the trees. And I'm just going to train every day the high line now. And then from there on, I started training high line, walking it first, then trying to ride my bike. And I never succeeded because the trees were moving so much. And a few months later, we went back to the Alps and to do the stunt. And this was crazy and even more frustrating because I didn't succeed once in uh, six days. We tried for six days in a row. Wow. Uh, from uh, Sorry, we tried for four days in a row and it didn't happen. It didn't happen at all. I fell off so many times. I was scared. I couldn't do it had no energy uh, after after fa- falling off for like five times i just knew i had to go home because you're so tired because it was at 3000 meters altitude uh, so no oxygen every time you're pulling yourself up you're tired you got to start again the drone has to be back in place oh man it was a nightmare uh, even lucas he said you um, he said i'm afraid you will never do it because you're scared you, it's like so I went back home, I trained for two more weeks, went back there, and there I was confident, okay, it's so like, now I'm going to do it. I said, I mean, I, I saw my crew suffering too, because every morning they at 5 a.m. they had to hike up with like all the big uh, gear and uh, cameras for like one hour just to get to the spot. And uh, I, I could see how everybody was like getting really fed up and exhausted and i said to myself dude today you have to do it and i did it (laughs) talking about overcoming fears and making the impossible possible yeah that's just an amazing story (laughs) never give up i suppose (laughs) then never give up and keep believing that's the most important yeah Earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that your sport is definitely not mainstream and you had to make something to be a professional writer, start making your own shows and doing these projects. You are also a Red Bull team writer. How has Red Bull affected your game? Um, Red Bull is, I think without Red Bull, uh, many sports, including trial biking, wouldn't be what they are today. Because back in the days, uh, brands would only sponsor soccer and tennis and the mainstream sports. And Red Bull came in the game and they were like, hold on, wait a minute. What if we just started paying these athletes that don't make money? Because it just costs them money. And they claim the whole extreme sports world because of this mentality. And they they became so powerful that, I mean... If you don't see a Red Bull helmet in BMX or trials or whatever sport it is, it's, I mean, it's always there. And uh, they have given me the, because it's such a great brand who respect working with the athletes so much, um, we are in weekly contact. We always talk about projects. They ask my opinion. I give them ideas. They give me ideas. They give me advice. Um, so it's really been an awesome an awesome uh, venture and, and, and collaboration. And um, other brands like also working with with me because they know if Red Bull's on board, it's going to be good. And so it's a, it's a positive uh, spiral and uh, the ball is rolling. And uh, I just push and push every year so it rolls faster and harder. And uh, yeah, it rolls from one project into the other. Um, but of course, Red Bull likes working with athletes that are proactive. A lot of people think, oh, he's sponsored by Red Bull and they do everything for him. And this is, a, this is wrong. They like Red Bull will work with you because they know that you make it happen. And it's not the other way around. It's like, if I have an idea, it's good. 
I get the budget, but I still have to make it happen. But you have to come up with the ideas and all that. So yeah, it's like, I mean, I think they are like an example to many brands about how to work with athletes and how to put value, give value to niche uh, disciplines like trot biking. Uh, what else you do for self marketing? Um, well, self marketing is a wide uh, it's a wide word, um, but uh, I think these days uh, it's all about social media. So your social media has to be on point. It has to grow. Uh, you have to put content on a regular base that's true to yourself, um, and just uh, keep it real and. Yeah, think about new concepts all the time, and think about how you're gonna market it to to the to the audience and to the and how you will incorporate your sponsors to. Uh, that's the most. That's the most the most important thing actually. What I, which I want to say is, and it's a simple word. It's a win-win. So when you market yourself, and you approach a sponsor or media or whoever you want to work with, uh, the other party has to win at least as much as what you're winning. And I think many athletes forget that. Some some kids, they, they're good, they're a good rider, and they go to a sponsor and say, okay, sponsor me because I'm a good rider. And then the sponsor will probably do that, but they will also want to have a lot of back from this, that investment. Because after all, it's investment, it's money that they give to you. And you have to understand that they sponsor you because they want to sell stuff. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, self-marketing, to come back to self-marketing, it's uh, it's all about win-win situations and where you have to understand that the people who pay you, they want to sell things and you just got to think how you can make it happen and nothing else matters. And it's a full-time job. I've been, I think I've spent as much time on my computer than I did on my bike. And that's uh, not even an exaggeration. It's a very important aspect to understand as well. That yeah. being a professional athlete nowadays, especially in sports like you're doing, needs a lot, a lot of work other than just riding and yeah. having fun and doing stuff yeah, like no. that. Yeah. If you just want to go ride your bike in a forest and, and train and, and, and uh, go home and rest, fine. But you won't get anywhere. Sponsors will not want to work with you unless you have a manager who does all that for you. But even then, the manager will at one point say, okay, now you got to go there and do this and do this and make a video and make a photo and you got to travel there for a photo shoot. Um, as long as, especially in sports like trials where the prize money is almost non-existing. So you have to do so many things on the side. If not, you will not make a living out of it. That's a simple fact. Yeah. Well, we understand here that it demands a lot of work to be in your level. And success really does not come for free. What has been your biggest sacrifice? My biggest sacrifice? Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe some parts of my body, my, uh, <laughs> my back, my wrist, my shoulder, um, I think they will need a lot of maintenance in the next years to come, but it's all right. It's a sacrifice, which I'm glad to make. Uh, maybe social life, um, you know, simple things like I just had a day off on Sunday with my wife and uh, we honestly can't remember when was the last time we did that. We're always traveling. We're always on an agenda. We always have to be somewhere. Um, it's been, I think the social life has been a big sacrifice and it's, it goes back many years when I was uh, 16 and my friends were having fun, drinking beers, playing billiard, uh, scoring girls. I was, I was very boring. I went home, I trained, I rest, I trained, I went to competition. I had a drink, but I had to be back at 11 because the next day I wanted to train. So social life. 100%. This was a big sacrifice. Even today, I'm 35. I don't have kids, for example. Hmm. I mean, I've seen the world. I've been to 60 countries and I'm I'm living the life and it, it all looks great. But in the end, you know, like you sacrifice a lot, which are normal things that maybe...
people with kids and a nine to five job have. I don't have that. Do I want that? Maybe, but I made a choice, so I accept it and I don't have to regret anything, but uh, it's definitely been a sacrifice. It's been awesome to have you here and I'm very, very happy that you accepted yeah. my invitation. Important knowledge about professional athleticism or what's the right word in English, but just grateful to have you here. You're a wise man and you are really putting a lot of effort to be where you are at the moment. I always Thank have, you for calling me. <laughs> I always have these two last questions I like to ask. So here it goes. What makes you feel down? What makes me feel down is, um, yeah, that's a hard, uh, if I see how, when I see how much disrespect there is from humanity on planet earth and I, I, I don't want to be hypocrite because my carbon footprint is really high. Um, but, uh, if only I had the possibilities to do it differently, I would, but uh, they don't N not yet but uh, it puts me down yeah when I see all these crazy things happening in the world to our beautiful planet um, and I just hope that uh, humanity will change like ASAP yeah and on the contrary what makes you happy makes me happy um, to go out and ride my bike and most importantly in a cool place in a very nice landscape where nature is pure and uh, where it gives me good energy this is what makes me happy and this is comforting to know that i am I'm, i have a lot of nice things and uh, i've done really well and um, sometimes especially in the beginning i was like hey man what you know what if i do this or and i lose it or and then i just realized I don't need much. If I have, I have a, I have a roof tent on my car, and a bike, and I'm happy, and this is comforting, and this is what makes me really happy to be happy with little things in life. True that. Even, we yeah, really even, don't need that much. Yeah. No, even I'm doing big things and I'm working with big brands, and it always look premium and poshy, and I mean it's all good and fun, but in the end, I just want to sleep in my roof tent and ride my bike. That's it. <laughs> thank you so much Kenny you're a real genuine guy thank you, you too man even if you have a skeleton in the back <laughs> <laughs>